it didn't seem necessary to me to stand up and be very formal since this is all of you know each other and I'm beginning to know all of you and our topic uh, is something or another related to the spiritual path and I think you're all well educated on the path so there's no place to just sort of start teaching you the basics I think far more effective would be just to have a conversation about any aspect of the path that you might be interested in so if you could be kind enough to either ask for subjects or for questions and we'll just go free form. How long are we here until 12.30 or 12.30? 12 o'clock? Okay, 12 o'clock then. So we have about an hour in this form and then another whatever in the other form. So wh where should we begin? Anybody have a question or a subject they would like to hear about? Yeah, I think one of the common challenges people face is, you know, how do we balance a spiritual life with, you know, the daily responsibilities and duties people have. Right. I think people would love to hear about that <laughs> and how to stay inspired. Um, we're using the microphone because we're making a recording. And if you speak into the microphone, it goes on to the recording. That's the reason for it. Otherwise, it's a little formal. Um, When I, when I was first uh, living in the Palo Alto community, which, which wasn't a community then, but was just the center when we started, I used to teach a lot of the beginning meditation classes. Um, I used to teach pretty much all of them for a long time. And the, the last class of the four, we would do it as a four-part series, the last class of the four that I would give would always be, what keeps you on the path and why do you quit? because especially for the most part when people were first starting meditation they were very excited about it they were thrilled about the possibilities they might begin to notice that it wasn't as easy as they thought it was going to be which is kind of a depressing part of it but nonetheless there's a certain enthusiasm so when you're in that enthusiastic part it's hard for you ever to imagine that there'll be a time when you'll struggle to hold on to what you're doing. So it seemed to me like it was worth bringing up. And there were several uh, reasons that I came to over the years that I, I felt was the critical factors as to why people stayed on the path or didn't. One of them is, well, just uh, there's three that I want to talk about here. One is that people cease being creative about what they're doing. You know, um, we had a discussion, uh, I, I think it was since I've been here, yes, about prosperity being a challenge to Ananda's future, which seems like a strange idea since so many of us are struggling t to pay the rent. It would seem like it would be such a relief not to be struggling for money. So when Swami first said to us that prosperity would be the greatest challenge Ananda would ever face, it seemed completely preposterous. Um, so it, it, when I had the opportunity, I asked him more thoughtfully, you know, to, to please explain that to me. Actually, I've written this whole conversation out in the Light Bearer book. It's somewhere buried in the middle of the book. Somewhere among the 220,000 words in that book, you'll find these words too. But I'll explain it here. Um, he said, because the nature of the spiritual path is is not selfish taking, but it's giving. And this is a kind of a, a, a seemingly paradoxical secret of the spiritual path, is that we think about it as getting Kriya and getting realization and, you know, getting spiritual advancement or getting happiness. But when we really become properly involved in the spiritual path, we realize that the spiritual path is about self-forgetfulness because the obstacle to the spiritual path is self-preoccupation and the opposite of that is self-forgetfulness. So we, whereas we tend to think of it as we get to be more and more of ourselves, we have to pause? Excuse me for okay. So I believe I was talking about self-forgetfulness, yeah? <laughs> because self-realization is simply to forget the small self and remember 
the large cell. And so there's this, it's like I was talking about prosperity. That's where I had gotten to. Yeah, Swamiji was, uh, he, he was saying that the nature of the spiritual path is selfless giving and creative giving. Um, and when things begin to come more easily, and this is what he was talking about, Ananda being prosperous, when things begin to come more easily, when, when people come to Ananda, and he was thinking specifically also of Ananda village where people live, or communities where people live, and it's easy to be there, and people have comfortable homes, or they have nice jobs, or whatever it is, when people start to receive a lot, they begin to think. It is a tendency of human nature to think, not what I can give, but what can I get when there is a great deal to be given. Jaya and I started at a time in Ananda when there was just simply nothing. So the idea that you would get anything, it just never crossed your mind because, you, you know, you had to figure out, we had to figure out everything for ourselves and there was just, it had to be a group effort, a pioneering effort just to succeed and there was just no place in it for what am I going to get for my position. But when money is easier to come by and, and circumstances are more comfortable, Swamiji said, it is an inclination to think about what can I get. And he said, as soon as we begin to start thinking about what can I get, the idea of uh, we, we gradually begin to become less creative because creativity is the secret of prosperity. And if we're not pushing to be able to generate what we need to survive, we may not be as creative in the way that we think. So we gradually become less creative. We begin to think more about what I can get for myself. And gradually what happens is inspiration is gone because it's really not as inspiring to live when you're calculating your own advantage. It's much more inspiring to live when you're asking the question, how can I serve? Swamiji said the antidote to prosperity, the, the pitfalls of prosperity is not poverty. He said it's the, the prayer, how can I serve? And then how can I serve better? Which automatically leads to one thinking you know, of what comes next. What can I do more? Instead of thinking about what's coming to me, we think about what can go out. So on the spiritual path altogether, I mean, if I'm talking about beginning meditation students or those of you who've been involved in this for many years, that is the critical key because prosperity, of course, isn't just money. It's prosperity of, of spiritual experience, prosperity of, of joy, prosperity of enthusiasm and devotion. And creativity is the opposite, I mean, is the secret of prosperity, which is a, it's just a very interesting point. The way Swami put it is, um, poverty consciousness says, whether it's spiritual poverty or financial, if I try this and it doesn't work, there's no other options, now I've failed. Prosperity consciousness says there's always a solution, there's endless solutions, there's endless possibilities, and therefore cre creatively we just keep trying something else. So what happens sometimes with people on the spiritual path over time, and I was saying this to beginning meditators, we begin to think only whether this is working for me and what am I getting from it, and we're not thinking about how can I be more creative in my practice? How can I give more in my practice? I mean, all of us talking to this group, we're all devotees, we're all disciples, we're all devoted. So, so we have inherently in our thinking, whenever I would teach meditation, I'm going back and forth between the present and the past here. I, I very early on would explain to people that meditation is a relationship because sometimes people think that meditation is just a practice. And we think of it as a practice that is only about me and my own mind and what's going on inside of me. But that inherently puts us on the wrong track. Meditation is a relationship. If you're a devotee and you have divine mother in your life or if you're a disciple and you have a guru in your life or, or God or a deity, in some way when you meditate there is another reality that is with you. And whether in a Vedantic way you realize that's just a symbol or however you want to think of it, about it, but I am in relationship to another reality. And the, the, my practice of meditation is to cultivate that relationship. 
It's not merely to sit here and fight with myself. It's, it's to be in that relationship. And it, we know from all of our human relationships, which is why they're given to us. Last night we were talking about the compelling necessity, the compulsion we feel to be in association with other people because it teaches us to purify our hearts. In any relationship, we know that if we stop putting out energy to make that relationship vibrant and rich, it gradually goes stale. And if that relationship turns entirely into what am I getting from this relationship, it can actually go quite intensely bad. So meditation in the spiritual path is exactly the same. It's a relationship. And what is appropriate at one stage of that relationship may not be appropriate at a later one. Anyone who has raised children understands that. Or let me phrase it differently. I hope everyone who is raising children understands that. Because what's appropriate when your child is three, you know, I, I remember being small enough. My father was a, 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 a large man. He, he was a not, a not a huge man, but he was a strong man. And so therefore he could always pick us up and I was a little skinny kid. But I, I remember my father's capacity to move me. <laughs> and I sort of, on one hand, I always really enjoyed it as a, you know, as a beloved daughter. I enjoyed the fact that my father was big enough to protect me and carry around, me around. But at times it was also annoying because he could just move me, <laughs> you know. And then we reach a certain point where it's either impossible, and more likely if you're a man and you grow bigger than your father, it's either impossible, it's not appropriate to just have someone other than you move you. And if they continue to act as if they still have that control over you, it can create dissonance in the relationship. By the time you can look your children in the eye, other things other aspects of the relationship should be in place. So we ourselves have to understand that our relationship with God, Guru, Divine Mother, Lakshmi, Shiva, whoever we're relating to, it can't become rote. It can't be, these are the prayers I say, this is the ritual I follow, this is what I do. Because that's, a, that's basically just a recipe for failure, and it, if not failure in the sense of actually deserting the path, it's failure because it won't be much fun anymore. You know, when, when your meditation is, no more, is not fun anymore, that's the time when you have to activate the art of it and not just figure, I have my routine and I just follow it. There's much to be said for regularity. There's much to be said for knowing when I sit down at this time, I'm not getting up for another hour and a half. I mean, there's much to be said for that because it just takes away the choice, the what do I want. But on the other hand, if you find that it's becoming undynamic. I mean, Swami calls it the art and science of Raja Yoga. We have to continue to put creative energy into it. This is, again, what I would tell my Meditation One classes. It's exciting and new, and so you're, you're constantly alert and putting creative energy into it. But if you stop putting creative energy into it, you'll suddenly say, oh, meditation's not for me. I enjoyed it at first, but then it got boring. But who got boring? <laughs> Was it meditation who got boring or you who got boring? And so it, it, that's, that's the first part of it. If it begins to wane for you, put out more energy and put out more energy in a new way. Seek out new resources. And by this I don't mean change gurus. <laughs> because that's a lot of times what people do. Well, I used to be really inspired by whoever so and so. But then I, I just wasn't inspired anymore. But now I'm really excited about so and so. This man came he was a journalist, as it happened, and he was a Gemini, which those of you who have a lot of that in your horoscope, like I do, that says volumes right there. So he was a Gemini. And he sort of was saying to Swamiji that he, uh, he's, he always, he's, he'd been through already several different spiritual paths. And he said, and he always started out with great enthusiasm, and it was really exciting for a while, but then it wouldn't be as interesting anymore, and then he'd find another one, and he'd be really excited like this. And then he said, but he's begun to notice that he keeps ending up back in the same place. And I remember Swamiji said to him, yes, he said, going in circles gives you a certain sense of accomplishment. The greater the circle, the bigger the sense of accomplishment. <laughs> so I don't mean to change gurus, 
I mean, unless you really are in the wrong place and you need to be somewhere else, I don't want to ever slam the door on that possibility. But mere newness is not progress. But the newness has to be self-renewing. Um, I remember, and this is only a little bit related to this, but after we did 12 years of litigation in America fighting for the right for Ananda to exist, at the end of those 12 years, it was such a relief finally to be out of the courts and out of all of that. I waited for my, for my innocent joy to return because prior to that, there'd just been a sort of childlike innocence about my happiness. But going through that experience where I saw the seamy underside of life on a way that I had never seen before, some of the, not the, not the guru bhais, but some of the attorneys we had to deal with were really the kind of attorneys who give the whole profession a terrible name. And I was just waiting for my lightheartedness to come back. And literally after about a year, it occurred to me that if I was going to be lighthearted, it was going to have to be a deliberate act of will, that it wasn't going to be automatic. And this is the d difference between um, the lightheartedness of, of inexperience and youth and the lightheartedness of wisdom that comes from experience. So it's the same on the spiritual path. Uh, I remember somebody wrote to Swamiji once and said, you know, I just can't find anything that I'm really enthusiastic about. I keep waiting for something to fire my enthusiasm. She was talking about work. But just nothing really makes me enthusiastic. Swami's answer, he says, well, stop sitting there waiting and start giving your energy to something. Because that's how enthusiasm comes, is when you start giving. So that's the first thing on the spiritual path. This is not automatic. It's a deliberate act of will. And if you find that your enthusiasm is waning, don't blame the path. Look at yourself. And you may have to take a new tact in order to get your enthusiasm back. Now, the other reason that people, um, f f uh, th their energy gradually wanes is they don't draw in enough energy from outside themselves, which is the other half of it. In other words, satsang. You know, if, if it's, this is a very, it's a very long and arduous journey from first aspiration to final realization. It's much longer and much more arduous <laughs> than anybody tells you at the start. <laughs> it's the very classic bait and switch. Is that, you understand that? That's what, that's a merchandising term. You advertise some item that's, that gets people into the store and by the time they come in, what do you know? It's all sold out. So they switch you to something else. They bait you with one and switch you with another. So the spiritual path is sort of like that. Because you just, in, in, in naivete at the beginning, you think, you know, it's just all going to come to us effortlessly. I, we, we used to joke about this my first 10 years when I was living in the, with a group of other uh, female renunciates, Brahmacharinis, and about five years into it, we all began to realize that we had really gotten into something that was a lot bigger and deeper than we first knew. We, we weren't regretting our choice. It was just uh, intuition was beginning to develop and understanding was beginning to develop and self-understanding was beginning. And we could sort of see between first aspiration and final realization was going to be a longer and more arduous journey, journey than we had thought. And the image that we used to play with was you know, we just dove off the dock to swim to the island, and we could see the island, and we swam like crazy like this. And then we, but we'd sort of, the island was a lot farther away than we thought. And we were beginning to get a little tired. And sort of, we were sort of all treading water and discussing our options, you know. <laughs> and we're looking back, and the shore is pretty far away, and we're looking forward, and the island is pretty far away, and it's like, do you see any other choices around here you know, like this? <laughs> and then, you know, the, the rest of the journey is not in such a frantic, sort of frantic, let's get this over with sprint. Swami often says, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And if you're running a marathon, you have a strategy to keep going. But part of that strategy is your guru buys. And, and geographically, you know, here where I am, you all have each other in a marvelously accessible and uh, user-friendly situation here. I mean, it's just wonderful, the neighborhoods and the 
accessibility of things as opposed to some cities in India and some cities in America. Plus we have now this extraordinary online element. So even if you are isolated geographically, you can tune in real time or you can tune into recordings. I used to, when Swamiji was living in Los Angeles for a couple of years, about 2010, he gave Sunday morning satsangs and they were live streamed. And we also gave Sunday morning satsangs, but we adjusted the timing of ours so that we could tune into his live. We just shortened and changed our Sunday morning and then would sit down at 11 when his started and watch it live. I've been watching Swami on video for years and years, but I was amazed how different it was to watch it in real time. I mean, there's a great benefit in recording, but to actually watch something in real time, you know, space is an illusion. So the vibrations are going out and I, I was very interesting to me. So nowadays, online real time and online recording both. I don't want to minimize recordings because I have 850 recordings on my YouTube channel. So obviously I have some commitment to recordings. But live is also good. But the point is you have to draw energy and inspiration in from somewhere. Because if you're just sitting there relying on yourself, it's unrealistic. Now, the first half of what I said was all about being creative. But part of what makes you creative is you get stimulated by something somebody says. I heard Swamiji speak hundreds of times, certainly. And it wasn't like I would remember everything. I would often take notes. It was more, mostly just to concentrate myself. But I would usually take one idea away from an hour and a half talk. One phrase, one concept. Because that was sort of about how much a person can absorb. You know, you just, you hear a lot, but you also receive vibrations, whether from recording or from live. Toward the end of uh, Swamiji's life, and of course, we don't have the option of, of live talks from Swami in the same way, but really, he, he speaks through those recordings. I remember one day, I was feeling really glum. Uh, just a whole lot of things were going on in my life, and I, I was not at the, my self-esteem was uh, not as high as I would have liked it to be. I was feeling pretty, pretty far down on the list of disciples. And I, I was in the habit of watching uh, the recordings that Swami made at the end of his life with Dharmadas and Nirmala, Ask Me About Truth. I think I'd listened to all of them more than once. So I'm listening to this. Really, this actually happened. I was asked last night what the most uh, notable incident with Swami that I ever had. And I said, told you a different one, but this one was very close. I, I'm just listening to Swami talk to Dharmadas and Nirmala on this recording like these... 13 minute recordings. I would often energize while he was doing it. So I would turn it on. I was in, so I'm turning it on and I'm energizing and I'm feeling pretty pathetic. And in the middle of the talk, apropos of nothing, I really think there was no prelude and there was no afterward. Swami said, that's why I always like to work with Asha. She has such a good sense of humor. <laughs> you know, like this is like six years ago, this is recorded. And I'm sitting there right now, and at exactly the moment that I need just a little reassurance from somewhere, he just tells me that he has a good sense of humor, and I have a good sense of humor, and that's why he likes having me around. I mean, whoa, that just picked me right up. You know, now, that was a unique blessing, I have to say. But part of the reason it came is that I turn on, I turn on Swami, and I listen to him talk. You know, the, the 12 minutes while I'm energizing is it like a, a good time because then he just talks to me and I start my day sort of with his voice in my mind and that keeps us fresh so when we begin to feel a little down about what we're doing ask yourself what am I doing and then the the last reason that people leave the spiritual path and again I was talking to newbies but it's really true for everyone is that it actually begins to work and that does sound paradoxical doesn't it <laughs> And what I'm talking about is that our awareness begins to increase. And even though in theory, we're all for expanding our awareness, in fact, when our awareness begins to expand it, it is not always comfortable. We become aware of the reality of the circumstances we find ourselves in. You know, the, the psychological concept of denial is a very real thing that we just don't want to actually look clearly 
at some of the things in our lives because we don't know what we would do if we actually looked clearly at them. So we just keep blinders on. We think that by, you see, this is the classic subconscious tamasic trick. By lowering my energy, I'll be happier. I'll just dull my awareness a little bit and I'll feel better. I mean, that's the siren call of sleep. I'll just dull my awareness and I'll feel better. The superconsciousness says, you have to expand your awareness to infinity. And that's the battleground that we're always standing on. I spoke of it a little on Sunday morning. That's the battleground we're always standing on. And so what meditation does is it pushes us out of subconscious and into superconsciousness. I mean, whether it's a huge amount or just directional, but whatever it is, it begins to tilt us. And we become aware, often aware of things we were trying very hard not to know. Whether it's our qualities within ourselves, perhaps a lack of talent where we hope to have more, a lack of discipline where we imagined ourselves better, a lack of kindness where we had a self-image that was different, or, or people around us who are perhaps not helpful to our future, but we don't know what we would do if we actually cognize that. I, I say to people that there's two steps to understanding the truth of a situation. The first is to perceive it. And then the second is to decide what to do about it. And they're not the same thing. Oftentimes, we try not to perceive something either because we don't know what we have to do about it or we're frightened about what we have to do about it. So in any case, we imagine that if we dull our awareness, we'll remain happier. But that is uh, absolutely contrary to divine law. So what happens is we start meditating. And honestly, even if we meditate only a little and very badly, we have sent out a signal to the universe, to Divine Mother. And if we are disciples, we've told our Guru, I'm serious about this. And even a little practice of this inward religion, <laughs> actually, Krishna says, will save us from dire fears and colossal sufferings. But when that awareness begins to increase, and we see the awful specter of change coming, most people would prefer not to change, then we are not sure whether more awareness is better, whether even a little practice of this religion is too much. And so often, even on a subconscious level, or, and, you know, things begin to happen because we're more awake, there's more energy coming. If we're actually seriously practicing Kriya or meditation at all on a level where we're generating more power here, and therefore more energy is coming up the spine, and therefore the karma in the chakras is beginning to move, and then things happen in our lives, people will often think, when did this start? Oh, it started when I started taking that awful meditation class. Boom, end of meditation. Or, you know, or when I became a disciple or when I took Kriya. I've actually heard people say something which I just can't stand it when they say that. Oh yeah, where do you take Kriya? Then your life will really fall apart which I think is the most terrible possible thing you could say to people because it's, your life is going to fall apart anyway. Welcome to planet Earth. <laughs> but with Kriya, at least you have a clue as to what to do about it instead of just falling back into absolute dullness. But the spiritual path begins to work and more is asked of you. I remember, you know, Swamiji was so honest with us and it was so fun especially when you learn to be honest with him. Um, there was a man uh, working in one of our enterprises, and he was very difficult to get along with. And Swami, and this woman wrote to Swami just complaining about him. And Swami uh, wrote back to her and said, just love him. And she wrote back and said, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> In another context, another woman complained about a very difficult co-worker, and Swami says, oh, just be his friend. She wrote back, I don't even want to be in the same room with him. <laughs> you know, it's like, we can be truthful about it. It's, it's all right, but more is asked of us. It's just more is asked of us, and we have to take more responsibility. And uh, there's a strong desire at that point not to do it. So we also have to watch when our when we stop coming to satsang as much or stop doing our practices as much, 
what am I actually trying to run away from? You know, and often it's just the sheer challenge of greater awareness. It's a responsibility. That's just, I mean, it, it just is. And we're comfortable in, in subconsciousness and superconsciousness is a challenge. It's just the way it is. So we have to rise to that. I used to dislike the word challenge. I actually said to Swami that he shouldn't use it so much. He simply ignored me, which of course was the right thing to do. But it's actually interesting to me. I actually now, I like the word challenge. I think if there was going to be one indicator of spiritual growth in my life, I actually think that would be it. I used to actually dislike the word challenge and now I like it. And you know, that's, that's the tra trajectory that we have to work on. We have to be excited about the fact that this takes everything I have and more than I have. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't have a chance. But we do have the grace of God. And that'll get us through. So, okay. Any other questions or comments on that or thoughts? Blasey also asked me about balancing responsibilities with the spiritual path, but quite frankly, I'm bored with that question. <laughs> I'll answer it again if I have to, but <laughs> if nobody rescues me, I'm going to have to answer it. Somebody rescue me. <laughs> that is the India question. In America, in America, the question is, is there a shortcut? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Americans are in a hurry. And then I get that, I get the, the is there a shortcut question is mashed. I mean, it's, it's, it's mashed in all these very elaborate other things, but when you parse all of it apart, it's isn't there an easier, fat, faster way? No, there isn't. And how do you balance your world and your spiritual responsibilities? Well, it's hard. <laughs> okay, is there another question? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Yes, Shamani. Did you want to come and get it? It would be easier, then I don't have to repeat it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, how can, so if challenging ourselves is one of the ways we can see if we're growing, um, how can we gauge if we're growing spiritually? If we're well, thing? I'm told that the Dalai Lama said, and so, because I don't want to take credit for this because it's not my phrase. I'm told that the Dalai Lama said, if you are going to evaluate your spiritual progress, you should never use a unit of time less than a decade. Which I thought was just a very interesting statement because I think anyone in this room, if you think back 10 years, you'll see, oh, a lot has happened to me in 10 years. Because, see, we also imagine, uh, because we're used to emotion rather than actual spiritual evolution, um, and so we, we imagine, especially, I don't know how common it is here, but in the U.S. where there's lots of self-help things, there, the, the people often have these emotional shifts, you know, this great moment when I realize things and everything's going to be different. And we sort of imagine that spiritual progress is going to be these great flashes of light, these fantastic meditations, these visitations from the masters, and when none of that happens, I mean, I only speak for myself, when none of that happens, you think that nothing is happening because it's just a sort of day-to-day -day grind where often we're just carrying out our normal responsibilities and nothing much seems to have changed. But real spiritual change, you know, we're dealing with the rhythm of many incarnations and we're actually dealing with the time frame that is eternal. And what, what we have to understand is each one of us has dedicated ourselves to developing the self-definition that we presently have. I mean, we didn't just like randomly pick this up yesterday. We didn't see it on sale at one of the stores and just got it. It's not like the dress we're wearing or the new fashions that we have. We have spent incarnations. I mean, just think about the life that you're living now, all of you, each one of you. Think how intricately involved it is. I often speak of my Jewish upbringing, the influence of my brother who was a debater and all these different parts and many other things that I see played in so, in such a fascinating weave to create the reality that I am right now. And this is one incarnation. Like who was I before that that got me to this? 
and before that, and before that, and before that, and just this stream that, by the grace of God, we can't remember. Thank you. Thank you for not burdening me with all those memories. But they're all there. And just as carefully as we make every decision that we're making now, we made all those decisions too. And each one of those decisions helped create a certain vortex around us of who we think we are and what the vibration of our consciousness is and you know what level we, we vibrate on. This is all about the chakras and the vrittis and it's very interesting. If you haven't seen it, I, I did a four-part series on the chakras. I actually did it for India as a live webinar. But in order to have it be live in India in the evening, it was six in the morning. When daylight savings time came and it was five in the morning, <laughs> we gave up. But anyway, we did these four parts. But um, that whole art of how it all comes together is fascinating to read. But there it is. So we see just a moment. I lost the thread. Let me find it. Oh, yes. So we, as, as we, we, oh yes, yeah, so we, we carefully build up this concept of who we are. And now I lost the thread completely. What even was the question? Pardon me? Oh, how to change. It was change. That's what I was saying. So the fact is, there's such a force like this that we, you know, you, you can't just reverse that. You know, in theory, you can. Because by the time you're sitting here, all those millions of incarnations, they don't exist anymore. Those bodies are dead, the people are gone, the places have changed. I mean, there's no physical reality to it. It's a vibration of energy, but it's an accumulated commitment to a certain vibration of energy. It's only energy. It can be shifted in an instant by a, a force of energy that's greater than the commitment of that energy. But that's the key word that's greater than. So yes, it's true. You can be enlightened in an instant. You can just have a moment's revelation in which you see everything and then you change. Ramana Maharshi was, I believe he was a teenager studying for one of these terrible exams, you know, that you all have here. And he just thought, what's the use of it? And he walked out the door and he never came back. You know, it was just as simple as that. But the revelation he had was more powerful than everything that had built up to that point. And obviously, clearly, there wasn't. He'd, he'd shed most of his self-definition by that point anyway. So in theory, we could shift it in a second. In fact, we have to generate as much energy in the new direction as we have committed in the old direction. Now, what saves us is the grace of God. If we were really having to generate it all ourselves, well, it would last forever. But when we become serious, and this is what I was saying a moment ago, when you accidentally tell God that you really want to change, he takes you seriously, he believes you. <laughs> and so he starts sending you what you need in order to put out the comparable energy to break the energy hold that this has. And that's why oftentimes it, it gets difficult. And the reason it gets difficult is because when the challenge is greater, we put out more energy. It's as simple as that. If everything is just going swell, we don't put out much energy. But if suddenly we're challenged, we put out more energy. So the way I, I jokingly say it to myself is, we can either run forward because the light is so beautiful that we want to merge into it, or we can run forward because the heat behind us is so unpleasant that we have to get away from it. <laughs> but the point is we have to be moving because if we're not moving, then we're not putting out enough energy. So God often lights a fire behind us because that gets us moving. So it's not a curse. It's because the path is working. Now we need to put out energy. But that kind of change, that kind of change doesn't happen in one dramatic flash, usually because we're incapable of putting out that much energy. So it's a shift like this. But if we continue and don't waver in our dedication, even if we're often inept or we stop and tread water and talk to our friends about whether there's an option, but as long as we're still doing it, then over time, and this is where the decade comes in. And, but see, the kind of change that you look back over 10 years, you, you're never going back. I mean, that person from 10 years ago has simply ceased to exist. It's not like I had a weekend experience and now I'm going to be a new person. It's like that person is just gone. 
And that kind of change, that's what real spiritual change is. Because then, no matter what comes, you, you, never, you never revert. Because those vrittis are, have just dissolved. This is who I am now. And I don't know how you tell whether you make spiritual progress. I'm not even sure it's the right question. It, it's, there's a, an exchange between, people ask that question all the time. But I think the problem is it's a lousy question now that I think about it. <laughs> because what would you do instead? <laughs> and, and so it's like, what difference does it make what the answer is? Um, there's a, 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 an exchange between Peter and Jesus in the Bible, which is one of my favorites. At the end of uh, when Jesus knew that he was about to be uh, crucified and that things were going to get really hairy for his disciples, it was going to be really tough for them, he needed to separate, se you know, he needed to send the weaker ones on their way. Apparently, at the end of Master's life, this also happened because Master knew he was leaving. And while Master was there, he could hold a lot of, he could hold everyone to him with his personal magnetism. But he knew that once he was gone, a number of people who were living in the ashram just wouldn't be able to hold to it. And the people who would be replacing him wouldn't have the same magnetism to hold people. And the whole organization would become weak. And it had responsibilities. So Jesus was in the same situation. He knew that his disciples were going to face something really tough and that they would need the strength of their shared commitment and they wouldn't be able to, to handle the weakening influence of less committed disciples. So he essentially sent them on their way. But he didn't do it by saying, you're too weak, you go, you're too weak, you go. You know, that wouldn't be a master's way. He just intensified the vibration of what he was doing, which actually, in the course of Ananda's history, I actually quantified it at certain times. I, um, it was like every five years, for a long time, something would happen in the, in the development of Ananda village, which was the development of Ananda, but then actually all of it, something would happen which would intensify the challenge at the center. It would raise the vibration and raise the requirement of, raise the intuitive requirement to be able to, to understand and continue to be committed. I mean, at the beginning it was things as, as transparent as Swami wanting to build a certain building but just many different things happened, including when we went into litigation. And there were two stages of, li of being sued, and both of them were big challenges. When Swami organized Ananda and made some of us light bearers and put us in ministerial robes, that was just a, a devastated a number of people because we were on the slippery slope to becoming the Catholic Church, and they couldn't handle that either. But one way or another, the I vibration intensifies, so Peter and Jesus, um, Jesus starts saying, this is when he began to say, eat my body and drink my blood. And now the Christian church explains to us that this is symbolic, the bread, you know, uh, the, the bread that he offered his disciples represents the body and that's, he has all the, they have all these different things. I'm trying to say the communion ritual is the body and blood of Christ. Master says, the body is om, and the blood is Christ's consciousness. He says that's what Master, what Jesus meant. He wasn't talking about a glass of wine and a loaf of bread. But the church explains it now. But when Jesus said it, he was just like, you know, just talking to his disciples. And he, had, he told them they had to eat his body and drink his blood. And he didn't explain it like this. And, you know, just like if you come to hear somebody talk and they start saying something really wacky, like sacrifice your firstborn and you know, ritually slay your dogs. I mean, you would just think like, <laughs> and, that's, and that's what happened. The, Bi the Bible says, the disciples said one to another, this is a hard teaching. <laughs> it's, that's so real. I absolutely love it. I mean, you walk out and you say into each other as you got, that man is out of his mind. <laughs> you know, up until now, I was, he made sense to me, but I think he's really lost it. Let's go back to the old rabbi. I mean, I'm done with him. This is a hard teaching. And then the Bible says, from then on, many walked with him no more. You know, he just drove them out. So then Jesus turns to Peter. And after it's all cleaned up by history, 
and the Catholic Church has declared Peter to be the first pope and all popes who have descended from Jesus, from Peter and so on, it's all neat and tidy. But in the moment, it wasn't tidy at all. And Jesus, and you can tell by this question, because Jesus turned to Peter and said, are you gonna leave me too? I mean, it was a real question. So that gives you some idea of what was really going on. What about you, Peter? They've all gone, are you about to leave too? There must have been something in Peter that would cause Jesus even to ask. So Peter's answer was absolutely fantastic because Peter didn't say, oh yes, sir, I understand completely what you meant by body and blood. You see, you were talking about this and so I understand it. They didn't understand, but I understand. He didn't say any of that. He said, where would I go? And where would I go actually implies that Peter had no idea what Jesus was saying either. <laughs> because he probably didn't. He didn't know what Jesus was saying. But he knew that this was his path, this was his life. And, and what Master says, which is so interesting about that whole exchange, is that the test was not about Jesus' spiritual stature, but it was about the disciples' ability to trust their own experience. Because it, was it yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday when I was talking, or I don't know who, knows, who cares when it was, but talking about how Master put spiritual responsibility into the hands of every single devotee. So if it's going to be in your hands, our hands, that means we can't rely on somebody else to define it for us, and we can't rely on somebody else to make us secure in what we're doing. You know, and the advantage of the Catholic Church or the Jewish synagogue or the evangelicals or whoever you're part of or, the, or Hindus, except I'm not as familiar with how the dynamic works here, is that somebody else assures you that you're doing the right thing, right? I mean, you're one of millions of Catholics and you follow the rituals and you can be sure that it, you're saved. But if the responsibility is in your hands, there's nobody that can promise you you're saved. That's why I guess we ask this question, am I progressing, am I progressing? So the only thing that we can rely upon is our own experience. Now see, this is the good news, but this is why there's so few of us, <laughs> because this is also challenging. So when Peter was able to say, where would I go? What he's saying is, this is, this is mine. This is me, and whatever this asks of me, I'm just going to persevere through it. So coming back to my thought, why do we even ask the question, am I advancing spiritually? It's like, even if I'm not, where would I go? Now, that I know sometimes the question is, is there more that I could do? Am I missing some key element here, which is slightly different? But just to agonize whether I'm making progress or not, which people do all the time, I mean, self-realization is self-forgetfulness. We, we have this weird idea that self-realization is perfection of the ego. And we don't actually articulate it like that, but that's what we think it is. We think, I finally get good at everything I do. I finally am good enough to be loved and accepted by myself and everyone around me. So I just keep taking this little self and I want to organize it in a completely better and nicer looking way. And that's part of the question, am I making spiritual progress? You know, can the little ego be comforted? And uh, probably not. Probably not, because that's not even the point. You know, I remember once someone was saying, Ananda should be a safe environment for people. These are these things that come up at different times in modern life. No, actually, I said it should be incredibly insecure. <laughs> Your ego should feel threatened pretty much all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if it's just a place where you're just going to hunker down and know that you're safe, I mean, what does that serve? So, no, we don't know if we're making spiritual progress necessarily, because how can you tell? Swami so sometimes, it got to be a joke between us. Whenever he would say, how are you, Asha? I would say, I don't know, sir, how am I? <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not going to say, you tell me, <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> But that, it was not a joke. It was like, how would I know? I don't even know what progress looks like. Maybe the only way for me to progress is to sink down into a hole so deep that I'll finally surrender to God. You know, how do I know? It's just like even impossible to say. All that I know is where else would I go? And I'll just persevere. And if this whole life is a dud, 
Well, it'll be the, the, you know, the necessary tapasya for the one that comes after. Where would I go? So that's what we have to cultivate in ourselves, not an, uh, not an inchi- achievement anxiety. There was an article in uh, Yoga Journal mag- magazine, which in the 70s and the 80s, before the internet, was how the spiritual community in America talked to itself, was through Yoga Journal. And, uh, and all of this stuff was just starting stuff, meaning this whole spiritual path. And there was an article called The Dark Side of Meditation, which I saved the article for years because I loved it, The Dark Side of Meditation. You know, that's like yellow journalism at its best, uh, worst. And uh, The Dark Side of Meditation, it was actually a, a, a more intelligent article than you might have thought. Many people take up meditation because they're such um, t- type A, you know, driven to perfection achievers. And in your society, you know, driven from childhood to get your right marks and get into your right universities. And in America, to start your resume when you're in kindergarten. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Um, and so, you know, such people are just about to bust with stress, so they take up meditation in order to do something about their stress. But now the goal is infinite. And so now, now I have to constantly measure myself against absolute perfection. And so I get to fail pretty much steadily all the way through. <laughs> and meditation itself becomes just the biggest stress of all. <laughs> I've actually known a few people for whom that was true. And that's the, am I making spiritual progress question, which is just simply a misguided question. Do I love God? Do I belong to this path? Where would I go? And that's progress, actually. That's what progress looks like. Whether or not you have great experiences or any good at what you're doing, it's just all about past karma and God's grace. You can't really influence it. You just put one foot in front of your, the other. If you, <laughs> my, One of my other mantras, if I could have done better, I would have done better. You know, this, this idea that there's something possible for me that I'm not delivering and that if I just get you know, mad at myself enough, then I'll deliver it. Actually, no. If I could have done better, I would have done better. So here we have it. This is the best I can do. I'm, I'm, and so I imagine this list of millions of disciples and Master is equally committed to every one of us. And it doesn't matter where on the roster anybody is. You're just on the roster. Where would I go? That's, that's what we are. There's the, you know, I, I sometimes think of it as master, a master's ankle. You know, I've just somehow, I've gotten a grip of his ankle. <laughs> you know, like a little child sometimes does that. I just have a grip of his ankle and really doesn't matter. He's not going to kick me off. That's all. <laughs> and as long as there, that's success on the path. Yes. My question is based on the com- uh, on uh, what you said uh, on, in the public talk on Sunday. There was one line which really, uh, uh, you know, it, it touched me. You said that conscious mind is a continuous fight between the subconscious and the superconscious, and of course, it's a fight for me because I'm pretty new to this path. But I would like to know that after 42 years of meditation, is it still a fight for you? And if yes then what is the intensity and frequency? And somewhere do you still use your rational mind? Because you also mentioned that you, you know, intelligence was your major hindrance. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And that resonates well with me also. So I want to know, do you still use your rational mind into finding your answers if that fight uh, takes place? Let's see, the, the, the problem is, and absolutely there's no question that time and experience gives you confidence. And time and experience just simply tells you, oh, I've, I, I've seen this before, I know what this cycle is. When you're 25 and your first big challenge to your self-definition or your equanimity or your first absolute total heartbreak hits, there's a sense that this is the end, you know, there's no future after this. But when your fourth, fifth, sixth, and tenth one hits, you kind of recognize, oh, I know the pattern here. And so just mere life experience on the spiritual path, even though it doesn't necessarily preclude your heartbreaking again, 
it gives you a completely different attitude to when that happens. That there's, there's not nearly as the same sense of panic and catastrophe. It's just, well, here we go again. And so that is a gigantic difference. Even if the superficial experience is still less than blissful, there's a much greater confidence that there's life beyond this. You can remember life before and you will remember life afterward. And that's where the rational mind is really a big help because the rational mind has developed the ability to see things um, calmly, objectively. Uh, and I, you know, the rational mind is our friend. It's not our enemy by any means. Every part just has to be used in balance. I mentioned Swami's remarkable intelligence and I, I didn't say what I gradually came to understand. The secret of his remarkable intelligence was the courage of his heart. Is that he was unafraid. And this is what I was saying earlier. He wanted awareness. He was unafraid of awareness. And as a consequence, nothing blocked him from true perception. Whereas I, being filled with fears, always had these, these walls which I couldn't go beyond. And so the, the ability to develop clarity of mind, it's not really intelligence. And it's not actually rationality per se, it's clarity. And Swami eventually named our publications company Crystal Clarity Publications because crystal clarity of perception is a tremendous uh, asset on the spiritual path and should, should, one should dedicate oneself to developing it. Because otherwise, when the heart begins to spin, you don't know which way is up. But if you've developed clarity of mind, then you have a way of, of grasping what's, what's going on with your feelings. Sometimes people will defend themselves against the need to have a clear mind by saying, well, they'll say this to me. I say this, I'm saying this a little ruefully. Well, you're a gyan, I'm a bhakti. No, actually, not really. Having a clear mind is not being a gyani. Having a clear mind is having a clear heart because reason follows feeling. So the clarity that the bhakti gives you in, from your love is what makes your mind clear. So, but what happens on the spiritual path is until you're self-realized, you are going to be facing and working out karma. And it's naive to think that just because you've been at it for 40 or 50 years, we've been at it for incarnations. I mean, that's one of the discussions in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna says, what if I renounce everything and try for God realization and don't make it? Yeah, that's going to happen. Arjuna says, my Krishna says, my devotee is never lost. He just starts over where he left off. So 50 years is nothing, five years is nothing. It, you just are where you are. And you keep at it until you're finished. And so there's no stopping point. There's, this is the difference between a sprint and a marathon. You think it's a sprint and I'll just apply myself for five years and then I'll be done. No, you apply yourself for five years, then you've gone over the hill and you see the rest of the hills. But there is a confidence that develops. But the, the biggest confidence is actually what I was saying. Where would I go? And that's what actually, that gives you more strength than anything else. Because in the first panic of your first, of your beginning life, there may still be the thought that there's an alternative to this. And that drains a tremendous amount of energy out of you. Because in that, you're just thinking there's an escape hatch here. And even if it's just subconscious, a lot of you is always thinking, well, if it gets too tough, I'll just quit. And that ties up a lot of energy. And when you cross the line, which is, it just doesn't matter. I'm not going anywhere. Then at least all your energy is focused in the right direction and you don't lose any. But from the point of view of does it get better? Oh, yeah. It gets better, not because it gets easier, not because it gets more pleasant, not because the tests stop, anything like that. It gets more pleasant because, well, I'm on the road to God realization. Isn't that wonderful? I have very, 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 very good karma. And I have such good karma that I'm getting all my bad karma. <laughs> God must really love me a lot. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, God never gives you more than you can handle, but sometimes I wish he didn't have such faith in me. <laughs> 
that's an honest prayer. <laughs> Even Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, but thy will not mine be done. And so there's a lot of power in that. That's where your power comes from. And yes, of course, well, I mean, some people don't, you don't freak out quite as much because there's a, you know there's something underneath it. <laughs> but still, I have my days. The first few months of this year were among the worst of my whole life just because really, really, really big karma hit and really big revelations, self-revelations and limitations. I mean, I, I'm very casual about it now, but I wasn't at the beginning of this year. And I was impressed. I was super impressed that I could be having some of the worst experiences of my life at this point. But they were deep and they were real and those limitations could not have been exposed a minute earlier. It was exactly what had to happen and I'm profoundly grateful for it. But no, it wasn't easy. But in the end, who cares? That's, I mean, I'm going to God realization and if this is the root, well, I mean, if th this is the only route, so what am I going to do, quit at this point? I vividly remember what it's like not to be on the path. And nothing that else that can happen compares to that. So, in, uh, When we, we were in those first years of Ananda, and I look at Jaya, because he was even more of a pioneer than I, he went through the first winter, the famous first winter. I wasn't there then. And... Uh, so people would say afterwards, oh, such hardship, you know, you had to endure. You did so much, it so, was so tough. I said, tough? I said, everything before I came to Ananda, that was tough. Just living without electricity in the snow in a little trailer, that was easy. And it was, and is. So that's what we have to cultivate. Sure, good question. I'll have time for one more, if there's one more. Are you moving toward the microphone? Or? No, okay. Yes, Aditya? I have a question. Personally, I've faced less. Do you mind putting it on the microphone? It just makes it easier for those who hear it later. Thank you. I was saying this is a question I've personally faced slightly less challenge with, but it's something that comes up all the time in discipleship, especially that uh, at what point, how much should we do? And how much does God do? Aditi, to your head is in the camera now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the audience loves you, but not the back of your head, and not that much. Okay. Where I'm losing some hair, too. Go ahead. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so uh, how much does God do? I mean, we are his instruments. We have to do our part. Uh, we have to serve a certain mission. Uh, we want to sometimes take more control than he wants us to. Sometimes we want him to do all of it. Uh, as we get more and more involved in the work or ask for more disciple, our discipleship to be deepened, uh, that thing just grows. Uh, how do we know inwardly what do we, what should we do, what does he do or the guru? Yeah, actually, there is, there is a question worse than is there a shortcut and how do I balance my worldly and spiritual responsibilities and that is what is God's will and what is free will. So we managed to hit that one too. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, now we'll sing the school song. Okay. That's a line from a P.G. Woodhouse song, movie, uh, story that Swami used to read to us. When Bertie Wooster gets himself in a terrible position, the, he's about to tell an off-color joke to a whole auditorium full of school girls. And the director stands up and says, we will now sing the school song. <laughs> so it's always been an Ananda phrase, when you find yourself someplace you don't want to be. <laughs> we will, so, so the question of free will versus God's will. You know, I read this line from Master, which is absolutely terrific and is the biggest cop-out to not have to answer this question, although I'll say more. He said, almost everything is predetermined, and it, uh, only those who are very enlightened can tell what part of it is free will and what is not, which is a very interesting point. Now, you are not actually asking the difference between free will and predetermined. You're asking between my will and God's will. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those questions, I believe, that's very simple, similar to am I making spiritual progress, which is that 
God's will for us is much broader than we think it is. You know, it's, it's because we are so important to ourselves and because we see ourselves as so separate from a, a greater reality, we imagine that God values our separateness at the same level that we value our separateness. And we imagine that God is involved in our egoic inclinations to the same degree that we are involved in our egoic inclinations. In fact, God's will for us is that we love him, that we love others, and that we forget our small self, and that we take the gifts that he's given us and give them to others. And how exactly we do that? Well, here, here, here's actually, I mean, how exactly we do that doesn't matter nearly as much as we think it is, think it does, it's as long as our intention is pure. And if our in, what, we, what we need to work with is not the question of who, whose will is involved, but how pure are my intentions? And so a lot of it just comes back, as I've said a lot of different times, to self-honesty and self-awareness. Because how pure are my intentions is what's going to tell me whether or not I'm, you know, whether I have some secret self-centered agenda here, or whether I'm really just doing my best to do a good thing to help other people. And a lot of our ideas are bad and they don't work as well, but even the, you know, the stumbles that we make or the confusion that we cause is part of what we have to do in order to learn. So we can't really tell, even by success or failure, whether or not we were attuned or not. The only way one can tell and is that just sort of by a growing awareness that comes from experience as to whether or not we were, the way I would say it, is whether our intentions were clean, whether I was clean in my intention. And I know, you know, that sometimes I'm not. I can, I can feel it. I can feel that I'm, um, I, will, I will put this more in the past tense than the present, to be fair to myself, that I like being important. I like being the one to make the decision. I'm impatient with your slow process and I just want to do it my way. You know, I enjoy telling you that you're wrong. And that's what you begin to watch for. Because whenever you can see that there's, there's a selfish motive in what you've done, no matter how subtle, then you know that you're not in tune with God's will. And it's not about whether we had this event on this day or that event on that one or took this venue or had this person speak. Those things are really quite incidental. It's, it's purifying the heart. And if the intention was pure, even if the action had to be stern, or the project failed, or other people were disappointed, because sometimes your intention is pure and you simply have to stand up to what's going on around you. So it's not just a question of being nice, because, you know, Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple. Krishna told Arjuna, stop the, the, the sun in the heaven so that Krishna could keep his vow. I mean. The, the masters are not always nice. You know, he told you just there to tell a lie. It was just like, the masters are not always nice, but it's the purity of intention. And even in the Bible, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So that's what we have to work with. That's what God wants from us, is purity of heart. And so if we just think about our intentions and move as carefully as we can, then you, be, you just begin to feel that you're in the flow. There was once, and this, I have to say, was many years ago, there was a series of projects and people were taking turns being in charge, and when it was my turn to be in charge, there was a part of me that wanted to show that I could do it better than the others had done it. That was who I was at that time. I'm not proud of it, but that's who I was. And so as a consequence, my particular part was a complete disaster. And Swami afterwards, I loved it. He said to me, oh, Asha, he said, Whenever your ego gets involved, you make terrible decisions. <laughs> and I was about 26 when he said that to me, but of course I've never forgotten it. And I've watched on all these years since, oh, whenever my ego gets involved, I make terrible decisions. And if you want to call that God's will versus my will, that's a way to think about it, but I find that question confusing. But I can tell when my ego's involved, and sometimes I have to go forward anyway because it has to be done. I can't stop just because my ego's involved. 
but I can at least slow down and be a little more careful and I can also learn the lesson later. You know, the, the beginning of this year, um, a lot of people I felt were being unkind to me, but I had to realize that I'd been unkind to a lot of people in my life because my ego would get involved and I would just plow through without an awareness of what they were doing. And I built up, I, I boomeranged, I sent out a big boomerang of, oh, I've been really unkind and now people have to be unkind to me. And so at the beginning of this year, it came like a bulldozer and just plowed me under. But, you know, lying there in this, like, oh, you know, in this world, mother, no one can love me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suddenly realized this is just karmic debt, that's all. You know, and that's all that happens. That's the other thing to realize, that's all that happens. If the ego gets involved, then you just set up a boomerang that's just going to come and hit you in the head at a certain point. And if you just calmly know that, then you're not, this is why years on the path help. Oh, of course. This wouldn't be happening to me unless I, I need it. And then it's not any less pleasant or heartbreaking, but it's not unfair, which is a huge difference. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. So just um, clarification on what Aditya asked. Uh, so when we say that um, the intent of our hearts is what matters in our actions, and if the intent is clear and it is full of love and peace, then our, we are acting according to God's will because that is the voice of God that we hear in our hearts if we are ego-free. Like. Exactly. So is it fair enough to say that God's will, when we, uh, so when we talk about my will, predestined will, and God's will, so the God's will pervades everything if we walk this line, if, it, if we walk this path yes. of spirituality, right. then God's will is supreme and it uh, pervades everything, my will or the predestined will. I, the last word, the, what was the last word? Pervade. Pervade. Oh, pervades, okay. Pervade. I, mean, I mean, yes, in a certain sense, absolutely nothing is not God's will. That's why Master said you, everything is predetermined. It's all very complex, and you, the level of consciousness that asks the question cannot really perceive the answer, because you have to be able to see it from a level beyond where we're living. And maybe, you, know, you have to look at the pattern, and then you see what the pattern really was. So on one level, there's just no intelligent, rational answer, which is why you have to be practical in your idealism and ask questions that actually work because this one will just spin your mind and at the end of it you won't know what you're saying anyway. That's what I've come to, you know. So it's just like, what is the point? But what God wants for us is that we joyfully and lovingly be instruments of his light. And, and the more we dedicate ourselves to that as an ideal, the more likely it is that we'll be in tune with God's will because that's what, how we'll behave. And as we attempt to do that, we will continually fail and failure is a teacher. And then after a time, whether it's a short or a long time, and short and long is relative, and all time is short compared to eternity, we gradually begin to sense it so that one catches oneself much earlier. And you're sort of just barreling along, and then all of a sudden, oh, I've been here before, I remember this vibration, and this vibration did not lead me to wisdom or happiness. So then you back off. The beginning of this year, it was a, a big community-wide thing happening. It was very important. I'm a key leader in our community. I was critical to the whole situation. I realized that I was so off that I literally just dropped out. I mean, I took my name off the emails. Oh my God, you take your name off the emails because I couldn't contribute. So I just stopped because any decision I was going to make was going to be so colored by egoic self-concern that I knew it wouldn't be God's will. I had to stop until Swami went over my head and I was capable of contributing again. But that's what you learn. And then you learn, well, Swami said to me once, once your magnetism is off, you're not doing any good anyway. And that's what I began to understand. It's magnetism that creates what we want to create. And so if our magnetism is off, ego motivated, emotionally guided, exhausted, anything, 
then you're not doing any good anyway, so what's the point? The way Swami put it to me is, you don't necessarily do more good simply by doing more. And so that too also became a way of my being able to tell. Of course, you have to expand your capacity to have good magnetism in greater and greater fields of endeavor. But when you realize that you don't have it and your judgment is off, you accomplish nothing by rolling on. You just do better to stop and say, either I quit. I mean, what I did at the beginning of this year was, uh, it was probably unique in my life experience, but it was probably because before I wasn't smart enough to know that I should have done it. <laughs> but uh, it's just, you don't do more good by doing more once your magnetism is gone. That's the difference between God's will and one's own. Okay. Well, I think that took us through. And thank you all very much. Thank you for asking questions.